here uh, this morning because um, I grabbed my notes off my desk, and this is the introduction to my book. <laughs> so I am using my jazz musician capabilities to take us to Ephesians 5. I looked down at my notes to make a bridge to get to where we're going. I was like, okay, you probably don't want to hear the introduction to my book, which is now written. Uh, but we're in Ephesians 5, and the Lord will guide us, okay? So say a little prayer for me so I remember everything that the Lord taught me in preparation. And if there's any adjustments, I'll fix it next week. We're in Ephesians 5 as we're uh, taking our journey through Ephesians 6. And as I mentioned to you, I'm not doing word for word. I'm taking big globs of the passages uh, to give us an understanding of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which was a circular letter. Some of, some of the letters were distinctly two people, but most of Paul's letters were circulated around the churches <coughs> so that all the saints were hearing from the apostle. And Ephesians was one of those letters, although he addressed it first to the church of Ephesus because he wrote it uh, just after he left there on his way to Rome. All right. So, yeah, come get your tablets, kids. You've got a coloring page for 9-11. Pick out the right color now. There we go. <clears throat> and let's read uh, Ephesians 5, 1 through 20. Therefore, be imitators of God, Paul says, as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7, therefore do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but indeed expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. 15. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart with the Lord, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The next lesson will be about submission, and that goes into chapter 6, but we'll stop there. <coughs> Please help us, Lord. Therefore, be imitators of God. There is something innate in every human being, male and female, something that's there by way of creation, whether it's regenerate or unregenerate people, that there's something in us that wants to please a father figure. There's something in us that desires to gain some kind of uh, acknowledgement from a father figure. Um, I... All my life growing up, uh, I longed for my father to be proud of me and to be able to bring honor to our family name even before I was a Christian. We talked a lot about those things in our home because uh, my great-grandfather was a great preacher, and the thing that kept me from very serious sin, believe me, I sinned, but very serious sin, was I, I was always warned since I was a little child not to besmudge my great-grandpa's name. 
and that was an uh, Italian American thing that goes on. But it's very biblical and it's very right, and it's inherent. It's inherent in every single human being. You can try to dismiss it if you want because you've had bad experiences with your father or whatever, but there's a desire to please him and imitate him. In the beginning, uh, you, you know, when we, uh, before we could acknowledge this pleasing thing, uh, we didn't know much. We just imitated our fathers and our mothers, but especially our fathers. Like for, for me, for instance, my father was in the construction trade, so I was in the construction trade. Uh, my father was a great athlete, and I tried but failed at that one. My father played the low brass instruments, and so so did I. And I got a hold of that one, and I'm still playing today, thank God. But uh, the athleticism part sort of, sort of skipped me. It went to David Adelini. In any case, uh, all of those things, uh, of course, I went to church mainly to please my father. It, we had, Sunday night was the only English meeting. All the rest were in Italian. And so as I was a young teenager, I was stumbling through it, trying to understand what's going on. But I was always there for the Sunday evening service. You know what it was like as a kid in the summer to come off the street at 4 o'clock and take a bath and get in nice clothes for a 6.30 Sunday night service? That was, that was tough. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to do it. But I did it because my dad wanted me there. Uh, and so we do things that emulate and imitate our dads. It's just innate in every human being. Now, when you become regenerate, it becomes even increasingly so for God our Father. That there's an inclination and a desire. The regenerate heart doesn't need to be told to do these things. There's a new desire to please God. It says here, find out what, discern what pleases God. And so there's something in us that wants to please God. There's something in us that wants to uh, uh, make him proud of us. The last thing that's going to be said to us is, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and we're all storing up for that day. But in the meantime, God is constantly nourishing us with, with thoughts. Why? Because we are his children. Notice Paul when he says, be imitators of God as beloved children. He didn't say as disciples. He didn't say as church members. He didn't say as slaves to Christ. He could use any of those metaphors. But he chose children because God is our Father. And I think Paul knew some of the things, was talking about some of the very things that I'm talking about, about pleasing a father. And so once we're regenerate, there's that new desire that's there. Uh, why do we come to church? Why do we go through things? Why do we uh, keep a good attitude during trials? Because we want to please the Father. We want to honor the Father with our lives. And that's inherent in us as regenerate people. So you don't have to look very far to know how to imitate God because we have the scriptures. And the scriptures declare, the word of God declares, God's character what he's like, who he is. We don't read the Bible so much like a math formula. If I do this plus this, I'll get success or I'll get money. But we read the Bible to know him. The Ten Commandments, why they are perpetuated forever, is because they're about the character of God. They're not rules and regulations. They're a list of what God is like. Because remember, the early Hebrews... They're first finding out who God. They lived in Egypt for 400 years. They only knew idols and different things. And suddenly they're learning about this God they heard, this God of Abraham. And a quick lesson, okay? Instead of God just taking centuries and centuries to teach, he gave them a list. Isn't he kind? This is what I'm like. And this is what I want you to be like. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. And so to imitate God... A euphemism is to obey his word. That's all it is. To obey his word. Jesus actually says that. I think it's John 14. If I had my notes, I'd have the exact scripture for you. Where he says, uh, if you love me, you'll obey me. Obeying God is the essence of worship. We take 35 minutes on a Sunday morning 
And it's so sad to me that the modern church has labeled that worship. The concept of worship is so much bigger than that. Worship is service to God. Worship is your life lived quorum Deo, before the face of God, every day, every moment, every hour. That's worship. And you and I have to make a decision every hour, every day, every minute of our lives to either honor God or dishonor him by disobeying his word or by feeding our, our own self-aggrandizement instead of serving him. And that's how we're faced with it. However, it doesn't take a lot of persuasion for the regenerate person. Preachers who preach law and shove it down your throat and say, you should be doing this and you should be doing that, they don't understand that we're so grateful to be God's children. We want to do this. Just tell me, you know, stimulate it in me. Help me understand it. Instead of forcing me to do it just by rote. Because, unfortunately, once a lot of young people leave the prison house of their parents, you find out what's in them. It's like the proverbial sponge in the counter when we were raising children. If you want to find out what was last sopped up by the sponge, just squeeze it in the sink. It's either Kool-Aid or milk or orange juice. But when God puts the squeeze on you, we find out what's in each of us. You see? And so when you hit a trial, when you hit a temptation, don't curse God. He's just only bringing you to reality to say, hey, this is what's in you. Are you pleased with that? Do you think that pleases me? So God has called us to imitate him as beloved children and to walk in love. Boy, if there's anything that's been abused in this modern time, it's that concept of love. To walk in love. My girlfriend and I are in love, so we're going to move in together and we're going to have a baby before we get married. You see, they don't read the rest of the verse here, which we're going to read in a minute. What's wrong with two males being, uh, having, uh, participating with one another and two females? Because we're in love. God loves love. I even heard this argument, Paul. I love this unborn child that I'm carrying, but I'm going to terminate it because I don't want it to live in this crass world. And they're using killing a child and the basis of it being love because they don't understand the concept. But Paul defines it in the very next few words. And walk in love, verse 2, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what is love? It's as Christ defines it, as self-sacrificial is love. Young ladies, if, if you are being friends with a male and he says these words to you, I need you, oh, I can't live you. Know, run 180 degrees the other way. Just get out, leave him alone because he doesn't understand what covenant love is. Covenant love is self-sacrificing. It's not luck looking to get, it's always looking to give. I saw a lot of heads go down on that one, so I'll just stop. <laughs> I'm having a little jazz feast with the Lord now because I don't have any notes. It's kind of, I'm having kind of fun. Because a lot of this isn't in, in my notes, I know that. But let's keep reading here. Uh, he goes on to, to say in the following things here, these list of don'ts. He goes on to say, because we love God, because we're his beloved children, because we desire to imitate him, because we desire to please him, we won't have anything to do, verse 3, with sexual immorality or impurity or covetousness. We won't have anything to do with those things. Un that under, the, under those don'ts is the banner of love. Because I love God, I'm not going to have anything to do with sexual immorality. Uh, one version says this, uh, covetous, not even a hint must be named among you of these things that the, the unregenerate do. Not even a hint. Don't even leave a shadow of consideration that you might be involved in some kind of illicit relationship or whatever it might be. Oh, this is too hard. This is the 21st century. We should be able to do whatever we want to do. I'm talking to the regenerate who want to please God. 
If you don't want to please God, just look at your phone. But the incl- I'm appealing to the new inclination that says, I want to imitate God, so I'm going to live this kind of life. If you're taking notes, because I don't have any, it's, it's, how to, <laughs> it's how to live the life before God because, by grace, we've been saved. Paul now moves into his imperatives, it's called, the duty of the Christian once he has, by grace, been saved through faith. That's what we're talking about. Christian living is a way to say it. And that's really what the latter part of 4, 5, and part of 6 is all about. Christian living. Paul is great that way. He gives the doctrine and he gives the duty. He says, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't any talk or there isn't any joking. But in many words, there's transgressions. Here's the key, is control your speech by the, by the grace of God through the, for the Holy Spirit so that whatever, you never leave an impression with somebody that makes them think or image something that they're going to sin with. So if it's a joke that's crude or crass, just eliminate it, just stay away from it. Now, I grew up on a construction site, and all, I was a brand new Christian, and uh, all the, my dad's workers uh, made sport. It was a sport of them to try to defile me all day long. They tell me the filthiest, raunchiest stuff, and you can't get away because you're on a spray crew. There's three workers working together, and they would just trade jokes the whole time or say crude things to try to, just to mock me. And it, it was hard. It was difficult. I tried uh, the transistor radio. I listened to every preacher. I had no discernment. I know on whatever station was carrying me, and I had earplugs. But my uncle, who also owned the business, came and he pulled the earplugs out and took my transfers and threw them in the trash. You can't do that when you're on a spray crew. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but the point is, I couldn't run away from it. So I had to learn early how to deflect and how to just keep my heart and mind pure because the jokes and things were so filthy. So good jokes are, are welcomed because we could use a little humor. Isn't that right, Russ? <laughs> A good joke. A good joke like this. What do you get when you have when you cross a jack-o'-lantern with a math equation? Pumpkin pie. See, that's a good joke. It doesn't leave you with a negative thought. It's a happy joke, and it reminds you that we're in fall. Thank God. Thank you, Lord, for that. That was fun. Instead of that kind of talk, let there be thanksgiving. And we're going to cover that in just a second, because Paul says. For be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and uh, of Christ and God. So it's not just be moral. It's not just uh, let's be a little better people than we've been before. It's about life and death. And people who continue in these things are headed one, into one place, Adam's destruction. The sentence on Adam, he's already condemned, is death. But for us, death has been taken care of, and now we live an abundant life. And so Paul is saying, let's be consistent with our new nature. Let's be, let's be honoring of God and proving on a daily basis that I am the light of the world, even though I once walked in darkness. Okay. <clears throat> Let no one deceive you, verse 6, with empty words. And it's because of these things the wrath of God, God comes upon the sons of disobedience. This is the second time Paul has used the term sons of disobedience, <coughs> excuse me, referring to the unregenerate, which makes us what? Sons of obedience. So we're being consistent with what Paul is teaching here. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. What empty words is he talking about? Here's the empty words. You ready? You don't need the Bible. You don't need to obey the Bible. Just if it feels good, do it. If it feels right, do it. If it helps another person, just do it. You don't need the Ten Commandments and all this, do this, do that. Just walk by the Spirit. Those, my friends, are empty words. And Paul is saying, don't be deceived by them. Instead, stay with obedience. Don't be a son of disobedience. 
and always strive to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. You know, there was bracelets passed around in the 80s, WWJD, what, what would Jesus do? But that was kind of superficial, that little phrase there. It's actually, what does the Bible tell us to do? Now, you've got to imagine Jesus, you know, helping a lady carry groceries to her car or something. But we have the Bible that tells us what to do and not to do. It's fascinating that the, the Ten Commandments are written mostly in the negative. And that's how we parent, is it not? Don't touch the stove. Don't run out of the traffic. Um, don't watch that cartoon, whatever it might be. But when God does it, we say, oh, he's a negative God. He's terrible. No, he's a good parent. You're going to get burned if you look at another woman with something in your heart. You're going to get burned if you covet somebody else's prophecy, uh, property. You're going to get burned if you steal if you kill, if you kill someone's reputation. I'm sorry for all these politicians who are going to go swiftly to hell that all they major on is killing one another's reputations. I hate these election cycles. They're just, they're, it's like death every day, is it not? Why can't they just win on ideas anymore? It doesn't work, does it? You got to slam dunk everybody. What, Bob? They don't have any, which is a good idea right there. Here's the idea. <laughs> It's not hard, but we, we can't have God. That's offensive. Yes, you're right. He is offensive. And exclusive. All right. Verse 7, therefore, do not become partners with them. Don't participate. Jeff used that word, participate. That's a, a, a powerful word when it comes to the table and to Christian ministry and to Christian service. You participate with the Lord. You don't participate in deeds uh, that are evil or shady. Don't participate with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Don't participate. And somebody will say, well, Jesus, he ate with sinners and with prostitutes and tax gatherers, so I'm going to hang out with these unregenerate people. Oh, you're as strong as Jesus not to be pulled down by their sin? You're as powerful as Jesus to rise above all that they do? Or are you easily sucked in? Or is that really what you want? <clears throat> and equally, when Jesus ate at uh, a tax collector's house or he mixed with the prostitutes, I guarantee you he was communicating two things, repent and believe. He was there to lead them to repentance. He was not there just to giggle at a cocktail party. Look, I'm one of you now. No, no, he could never be one of them. He's the son of God. Oh, Jesus is so cool. He ate was, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be in this club and I'm going to do, And I, okay, yeah. If you're as powerful as Jesus and you can do that, God bless you. But I don't think that many of us are, to be honest. My father, who tried to corral me and keep me in boundaries so I just didn't overflow into grotesque sin. When I went to the University of Tulsa, he, he sat me down and he said, I only ask one thing of you, that you do not join a fraternity. And it's amazing when you get to the campus how you are so inundated with becoming a Greek. Uh, I had two good friends from my old high school that were in Lambda Chi Alpha. And they were majorly trying to get me to join. And it was tempting. But I obeyed my dad, and I did not get involved. And then I understood, because it's during college that I got saved. But I understood, because when you're in a fraternity, you do what they do no matter what. If they're going to have, all get drunk and throw up on the floor, that's what you're going to do. If they're going to have girls come over after hours and you're not supposed to, that's what you're going to do. You see? And so the temptation was tremendous because I loved sin. But it was one of those little barriers that God threw up in my life as he consistently was driving me down the path of righteousness in 1975. Okay. Therefore, do not become, for at a time you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now, you're not E.T. with a shining belly. Okay. 
to walk in the light, I love how Paul defines what he means whenever he says things. The New Age people give this, oh, we're the light. Oh, we do. Uh, come to the light. Do you see the light? Goodness gracious. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right, and true, which is a euphemism for obeying the word of God. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The next time you're making a decision, the next time you're at the precipice of having to decide one way or another or something, ask yourself this question. Is this pleasing to the Lord? Does this honor him? Because that's what my life is all about now. It's not about me. We're going to get down here in a minute to uh, verse 16, 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Walking unwise is walking in your own light to, to honor you, to perpetuate you, to sell you, self-aggrandizement. To be wise is walking the path that honors God, that extols God, that pro proclaims God, that brings God into the equation with everyone. <clears throat> Look carefully how you walk. Verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? Well, I want to know the will of the Lord. What's the will of the Lord for my life? It's not hard. First Thessalonians 4.13, this is the will of God for you. What? What is it? Your sanctification. God has one path for you, one will for you, to make you more like Jesus every day. Well, that doesn't tell me what kind of job I'm supposed to have. I think he leaves a lot of those things to us, and he guides us, and that's all great. But the will of God overall is that you are walking, you are being sanctified every day, even pressured by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, to become more and more and more in the image of God. Now, it's interesting, Paul, uh, this supports a, a, a premise that a lot of theologians have, that the, the disciples and the apostles who were, had very much company together, they borrowed things. This is language borrowed from John the apostle. John was all about light and darkness. And I can say that because I have the introduction to my book of Revelation right here. But that's how we know John was the author is because it's all about light and darkness. And the light overpowering the darkness. And so we can spend all our time cursing the darkness. We can spend all our time parading with signs, you know, this is evil, don't do this or whatever. <clears throat> but how do you get rid of darkness? What's the way that darkness is expelled? You turn the light on. One of the early times that I went to Africa, <coughs> I was in Livingstone, and the church wasn't there yet. We were getting the church started. And uh, I came there for weeks of teachings and help and what have you. And they led me to kind of a hut and said, this is where you'll be sleeping. I said, oh, grand. This is great. Now, this is a, I don't even camp, okay? I quit the Weeblos and Boy Scouts because they wanted me to sleep on the ground. You want me to what? I'm not sleeping on the ground. That's pretty bad. So here I am in Africa, right? Here's where you'll sleep. And it was dusk, nighttime when they brought me there. And they opened the door, and there was electricity to it, and they flicked on the switch, and everything that was in my house... Cockroaches the size of that cup. Rats, snakes, even the moths look demonic. <laughs> You'll be fine. And so I got in there, and he said, turn out the light and you can go to sleep. I didn't turn out the light. Because the light, they don't, these creatures don't like the light. And every creature who's not of God, and those are not of God, uh, hate the light. They hate the light. Men love darkness more than they love light. They don't want light. Why won't they listen to me? I've been preaching now in my office for all this time. And, because they love darkness. You're going to get your one or two Nicodemuses. But they can't stand when light comes into the room. They can't stand it. 
Now, I've got a cool little story. It's written down, so I wouldn't butcher it, but I'm going to probably butcher it and say it now. Um, Woodrow Wilson uh, gives a little piece in one of his writings. I, had, I, re I read a lot of Woodrow Wilson because here's a fun fact for you. Woodrow Wilson, who basically was a liberal, he started the United Nations, okay? His dad was named John Ruggles Wilson. His father was the permanent clerk of the Confederate Presbyterian Church in America. Woodrow Wilson's dad, he was running from his dad. He was running from all those things of God. And he went the opposite direction. And he tells a story. That's, by, by the way, I just want to tell you that for extra credit. But uh, he, he writes this little story. He says, uh, I went into a barber shop to get a haircut. And he says, he sat down in the chair, and they started proceeding to give me a shave and a haircut. And in walks an individual, and everyone seemed to know him. And he came and sat in the, next, in the chair next to me. And he said, I was listening to this man banter with the, the hair cutter and the shaver, and everyone was listening to him. And it was as if the room had taken on a new, new feel. It says the room was lifted somehow. And I didn't say a word. I'm the President of the United States. I just listened. He said, when I finally got done with my haircut and everything, I realized that the man in the chair was D.L. Moody. So I sat in a chair and waited and listened to him the whole time. He said, it was like an evangelistic service. Now, he would know what those were, you see. He said, but I was so profoundly touched that all of the, the, the entire atmosphere of the barbershop changed in an instant. Men spoke in lower tones. They didn't know who he was. They didn't even know his name. And there was a quiet joy that filled the atmosphere, even while I sat there. And I left in awe of this man, D.L. Moody. It doesn't even say he witnessed of Christ. It's just that he was walking in the light, and the light has effect wherever you go. You don't need to go on Washington, D.C. And, and march and carry a banner. If you want to do that, God bless you, you can do that. But do you understand? Your light is exposing darkness all the time. Now, don't be ashamed of it. Don't dim it. Don't excuse it. Oh, I'm sorry. Just be who you are, and the cockroaches will come out. And in this day and age... They may bite you. They may afflict you. But that's just a, like a signature that God is with you. And the light of God, you carry it. You no longer participate in the deeds of darkness. But rather, you expose them. We're going to go do this now. I remember when I was in college, um, I wasn't in a fraternity, but I lived with the golf team. They didn't have room in the dorm, in the jock dorm for the golf team, and so they put him where I was living, and I was, I was the only guy in, I was, who didn't play golf. And they were all from Chicago, and all their dads sat on the, what do they call that equivalent of Wall Street in Chicago, stock market exchange. They were all rich, rich kids. They all came to school every year in a brand-new Camaros. I didn't even have a car. And they just, they lived so wild, it was unbelievable. And so one night, uh, they said to impress some girls that they were having into the thing and everything, they said, we're going to go to Target, and we're going to steal Christmas trees for all the girls off the lots at 3 o'clock in the morning. And God had been dealing with me. I can't say at that point that I was really walking in great stuff. But God had been dealing with me. And I said, uh, no, I'm not going to go. And they ex fully expected me to go. And they started mocking me and making fun of me. And uh, they went ahead and stole the Christmas trees. They all got arrested and all got put in jail. These are the same guys that scaled the tower at ORU University to try to extinguish the eternal flame. And they went to jail for that. But I, had, I would have gone to jail and explained to my parents and my grandmother what happened. And so God spared me. That's when he was beginning to work on me. 
and those kind of things. But I say this again, the greatest power you have as a Christian now, because you're regenerate, is to say no. That's the greatest power you have. No, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to say that. No, I'm not going to watch that. You have a power to do that now without shame and without excuse. Oh, pardon me, I'm a Christian. That's why I'm doing it. Just relax. Just be yourself and walk in the light. Okay, let's finish this, this up. I'm going to be amazed what my notes say that I didn't even say one thing on them. <laughs> Making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will. Okay, and do not get drunk with wine. We are recovered this, for that is debauchery, which means excessive partiness. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual thong, songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean, I hated it at New Covenant, we say, okay, let's sing to one another. I don't want somebody singing to me. It just felt weird. Okay. What that really means is, it doesn't mean physically go ahead and sing. It just means you're always bubbling up with gratitude. You're always bubbling up with thanksgiving. You're always bubbling up with a, a song about God's faithfulness, a song of God's gra graciousness, a song about God's rescue, a song of whatever it might be. It's always churning and bubbling up. Stay that way. Being drunk with wine is artificial. It causes you to lose your control of yourself. And we covered this, so I'm not going to go too deep into this. But be filled with the Spirit. It means be under His utter, sovereign, total supervision. Remember, God's not liquid. Blah, 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 blah. It means to be full of the Spirit means to be totally under His dominion all the time, which is Romans 6. Present yourself to the Lord. Yield yourself in the old King James. And your members as instruments of righteousness... Do that first thing in the morning. See what happens. See what happens. Father, I desire today to be a vessel of honor for you. Put me in situations today where I can express that honor. And it may be exposing darkness. It may be in situations where you have to say no. But you're bringing honor to the Lord when you do these things. And the motivation... Thanks always giving everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of what Jesus, Paul's going full circle and saying, because of what Jesus has done for us, our hearts are so filled with gratitude. Be this kind of person. Don't give in to the artificial things of the world, but give in to the real sense of walking with God and being filled with thanksgiving. I do have it in my notes. It just came to my mind. B.B. Warfield said, our mouths should be organs of thanksgiving. And they were, he was writing that at a time when they were fighting whether or not to have musical instruments in the church. He said, our mouths should be organs of thanksgiving on a constant basis. So you don't have to give them uh, an exegesis of, Exodus, of the book of Exodus when you meet somebody. But you can communicate on a regular basis. You know, I, I, I use the phrase, uh, thanks be to God on a regular basis when even in normal life when I'm just dealing with something. So I say, hey, did you know this was a dollar off in the grocery store? I say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. I don't even witness. I don't leave a track or anything, but I, I'm, I'm just grateful. I get a dollar off. That means a lot today. <laughs> and so just walk in light. Share your light. The cockroaches will run. And let's trust that they'll run to the Lord before they get squashed. All right, let's all stand. Thanks for bearing with me. Holy cow, I really rambled. Yes.